uh, prior to joining the Navy, I've been in the Navy as a chaplain for almost nine years now. And then prior to that, I worked at a vineyard church in Southern Connecticut, and I was the associate pastor there for a year or a year and a half, a couple years. And um, I've been attending vineyard churches consistently for the last 18 years, I think, since kind of the end of 1997. So coming up on, I don't know, 19 years, 20 years, whatever that is. Uh, as the years slip by, the numbers just add up. Uh, most of you I haven't seen since before Christmas, and, uh, you know, it feels a little late to wish somebody Merry Christmas, because we're already past New Year's, but Merry Christmas anyways. Uh, our culture moves so fast, we're always rushing from one thing to the next. I had this image in my mind of stopping by a Vons or a CVS and you know, this morning on my way home to pick up something, and they probably already got their Valentine's Day stuff out. I, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised. I can't confirm that, but uh, as fast as we move. There was a funny uh, joke that a friend of mine put from a, a friend of mine from the vineyard in Connecticut where I used to work on December 27th, which I think was a Tuesday. He put this up. I thought this was kind of funny. 363 days until Christmas, and people already have their lights up. <laughs> Unbelievable kind of encapsulates this idea, we move so fast, we're always forward-looking. It's like by, by, Christmas, by, by noon on Christmas, we should already be getting ready for the next thing. Uh, but, you know, there are 12 days of Christmas. And depending on your tradition growing up, what sort of tradition you grew up in worshiping in, or your faith background growing up, you may not really know that there are 12 days of Christmas, but except for, for the song. Uh, traditionally, the churches around the world historically have celebrated Christmas from Christ's birth on December 25th all the way until January 6th, which is uh, traditionally called Epiphany. That's the day where the churches around the world celebrate um, the wise men coming and visiting Jesus and the first people to see the risen Lord. And so 12 days of Christmas, that means that uh, because Christmas fell on Sunday uh, last week, uh, that we're on day eight. So happy eighth day of Christmas. Keep your eyes out for maids of milking anywhere around the city. You know, there's a company, it's a financial services company. They do the Christmas price index. Have you guys heard about this? They do it every year. They take all the items in the 12 Days of Christmas song and they add up how much they would cost. If you were actually, you know, on the 12th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. If you were to give somebody all of those things, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, it, it costs more than $34,000 this year, to give somebody the full 12 days of Christmas. Uh, so if somebody gives you all those things, they really must be your true love, because that is an incredibly expensive gift. I read uh, this week, it says, the cost of this year's Christmas price index rose ever so slightly, driven by price increases for turtle doves, <laughs> which are apparently hard to find this year, and uh, wage increases for the drummers and the pipers. So, and that, that's true, that, that's true. Apparently the, the fight for 15 has extended all the way to the musicians, the pipers, and the drummers, and uh, I hope they're getting well paid. But since we're technically still in Christmas tide, that's the, the 12 days of Christmas, I don't wanna be too quick to move on. You know, we talked about our culture moving really quick. I don't wanna be too quick to move on. So let's honor this last Sunday of the Christmas tide season by keeping our focus a little bit on Christ's birth and explore some of the implications for, for our life together. Uh, especially depending on what your last week looked like, you may not have had as much time to spend in traditional modes of, of worshiping God as we normally would on a regular Sunday. So if you have a Bible or, or your favorite reading device, would you turn or tap your way to Hebrews chapter 10? And while you're turning there or you're firing up your, your favorite device, your phone, whatever you've got, iPad... Uh, if you're new to faith or the Bible, the book of Hebrews is in the New Testament, it's toward the end of the Bible, about three quarters of the way through, maybe a little more than three quarters of the way through. And we're going to be reading in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 19. So Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. I'm going to read the English Standard Version translation. It's going to be up on the screen here in just a second. Uh, but if you have a different version, please follow along. And as we prepare to read God's word together, would you bow your heads for a brief word of prayer with me? Gracious God, we welcome you today on this beautiful day. We thank you for the rain, Lord God. We also thank you that the sun comes out, reminding us that your mercies are new every morning. On this last Sunday of the Christmas season, let us remember all the ways that your extraordinary and precious gift of your son means that we can have life every day. 
Let us never take that for granted. Open your word to us today. Transform our hearts and our lives as we hear from you and draw us as a community closer together and closer to you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, uh, follow along with me on the screen, on your device, in your actual printed Bible, if you are old-fashioned enough to have one. Got one right here. Um, Here we go. Therefore, brothers, and the writer's talking here to both men and women, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's going to be our main passage today, the Word of God for the people of God. To understand the passage in Hebrews today, I, I want to give us a little bit of background on how God was present to Israel before the birth of Jesus. As we think about Christmas, we live after, after the first Christmas, we, we have a different uh, and, and more fundamental way of connecting to God directly through His Son. But before that, in the Old Testament, God created a way for the people of Israel to experience His presence, and He gave them the law of Moses. And uh, Israel could seek holiness through the animal sacrifice and through temple worship, And in, um, of course, in Scripture and and throughout our lives, we see how our sin separates us from God and keeps us apart from the fullness of the presence of of the God of love. But uh, at the heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies. And I I found this helpful description. It's, It's hard to see, but you don't really have to worry too much about it. This is what the tabernacle would have looked like. I found this really cool picture of... It was put out by the Logos Bible software people, so you can look it up online if you're interested later. The main thing to know is you have the the outer um, wall, which is a a series of curtains, and then you have uh, the the place where the offerings are sacrificed. That's there in the middle where you see the cow and the person and the flame. And then you have the main part of the tabernacle. And the Holy of Holies is the really smallest, tiniest back section in the very, very, very far back. And uh, just so you can see a kind of a size comparison, the, the top rectangle there, that's a football field, an American football field. And then the small little rectangle, that would have been about the size of the entire tabernacle area. So the Holy of Holies is just that small little tiny square at the back corner of the rectangle, about, right about at the 50-yard line. And the Holy of Holies was only accessible to the uh, Israelite high priest. He was the only one that was allowed to go in. And once a year, on Yom Kippur, which is the Jewish Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter this small, windowless section of the temple, of the tabernacle, to burn incense and sprinkle the blood of a sacrificial animal on the mercy seat of the ark, where the presence of God was said to dwell, where God promised to dwell. And... Uh, As he did so, the high priest would atone for his sins and for the sins of the people of Israel. And God promised in the Old Testament, through the law of Moses, that he would appear in the Holy of Holies. It says here in Leviticus, uh, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, who was the first high priest, not to come in at any time to the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. And the Holy of Holy was, was separated from the rest of the temple by this thick veil. It was a, a huge, heavy drape, and it was made of linen, of blue, and, and purple, and scarlet yarn, and it was embroidered with a, a picture of angels. And this was the barrier between the people of Israel and the direct presence of God. The Holy of Holies could not be accessed just by anybody, but only by the high priest, only once a year. In fact, it says at a different part of the Old Testament in the book of Habakkuk that God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. And so the idea was that the sin, had sep- the sin of the people had separated them from the direct, immediate presence of God. And uh, the veil and these elaborate rituals 
were undertaken by the priest, they were supposed to be a reminder that humans couldn't just carelessly or irreverently enter the presence of awesome God. So when we read our passage in Hebrews, all that's kind of a backdrop to what we read. That first section there, it says, we now, because of the birth of Jesus, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, no longer by the blood of the sacrifices, but by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. You see how, how the author of the book of Hebrews is, is picking up this exact imagery and saying something has changed, something is new, something is different. We understand the full impact of the incarnation, the Christian word for the truth that God became man in Jesus Christ, and the atonement, the Christian word for the reality that Jesus' death and resurrection pays the penalty for our sins. His birth his death, his resurrection, give us direct access to the presence of God that nobody had before. Now, here at Coast Vineyard, we, we try really hard not to use a lot of Christian jargony words. We want people to be able to show up for the first time at church, even if they've never gone to church before, and feel like they can understand what's going on without needing to know some kind of secret handshake or secret password, uh, which is good. But I think these two words, the incarnation and the atonement, are really important because the truth that God became man in Jesus Christ, the incarnation, is at the heart of the beginning of God's story as he, as he tells it all the way from Genesis to Revelation, and it's fulfilled in the atonement, Christ's death and resurrection. So uh, the reality that God became man, will you say it after me, incarnation? All right, that's your one, one theology word for the day. Theology word number two. The reality that Jesus' death and resurrection pays the penalty for our sins, that's called the atonement. Say atonement. atonement. All right, incarnation atonement. You learned a little bit of systematic theology today. You can go home. Hopefully your brains have, have grown in your heads there. And uh, Matthew's gospel, when it tells the story of Jesus' death, it actually says that at the moment Jesus died, that veil in the temple, that thick curtain, was ripped in two from top to bottom. And it was a supernatural event done by the power of God to make a very specific point. Because of the death of Christ on the cross, there no longer, we no longer needed a human high priest to perform a once-a-year sacrifice to allow us to go into the Holy of Holies, to be in the presence of God. Christ's body was torn on the cross, just as the veil was torn in the temple. And now we have direct access to Almighty God through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's awesome. That's awesome. And all this was possible because of the coming of the Messiah. So, uh, you know, the Bible tells us that it's our sin that keeps us from the presence of God, but Hebrews reminds us that we're invited in because of Christ's sacrifice. And so because of His sacrifice, because God cannot be in the presence of sin, but yet God invites us in, we know that it's Christ's sacrifice that purifies us and makes us clean before Almighty God. And, and later in the New Testament, in the book of 1 John, it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ's sacrifice cleanses us and makes us pure. Another part of the New Testament says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but he saves us. And all these passages point to the fact that we're made clean in what Christ has done on, in, on the earth, and because of that, we have direct access. And so in verse 22, we see right up here, it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because of what Christ done in making us clean, we're able to stand in God's presence. And then all of a sudden, Hebrews seems to go in a little bit of a different direction here. It says, um, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And it goes on to talk about all these sort of corporate acts that we do together. And so after talking about these deep theological ideas, access to God and, and sanctification because of his sacrifice, all of a sudden, there's this kind of shift to the corporate life of the body. And he talks about the confession of hope, the exhortation to love and good works, meeting together, and then encouraging one another. Why is there this shift in focus? What's going on 
that all of a sudden he kind of makes this shift from this sort of theological conversation uh, about a new reality to this kind of pragmatic series of exhortations. Or maybe, maybe a better question is, how do we understand that what he's talking about isn't really a shift at all? That it's actually one conversation that goes all the way through. We know, of course, that all Scripture is breathed out of God and is useful for teaching and correction. And so implicit in this little discussion about community life must be somehow an extension of this broader conversation about access to God and our continued experience of holiness and sanctification. So let me ask you guys a question. How many of you spent some time with either your immediate or extended family in the past, you know, 10 days? Oh, that's awesome. Like, so 90% of us spent some time with uh, either immediate or extended family over the Christmas season. I I did. I drove uh, more than seven hours on Friday the 23rd of December, slogged my way up through Los Angeles. It was pouring down rain. If any of you were on the road, I had to go over the grapevine and this whole thing so that I could spend time with my family up in the central San Joaquin Valley. I was with my parents and my brother and my nephew. And then my parents, they drove all the way back the other direction down here so they can be with me today. They're over there. Um, Yeah, yep. Why do we do this? What is this instinct that we have to spend important moments of remembrance or transition with our families, whether they're our, our biological families or for some of it's our adopted families, sometimes even our friend families that we, that we adopt through our friendships, especially in this era of digital technology where we have FaceTime, we have Skype, we have all these other ways that we can be present to people. In fact, given that San Diego is such a commuter city, I can almost guarantee that some of you at some point have used Facebook or Skype to be with somebody that you couldn't physically meet with over a holiday season. And yet, I drove seven and a half hours in bad traffic and terrible weather to be there in person. And maybe I'm crazy, or maybe it's just an acknowledgement that something like a digital technology is never going to replace that ability to be there in person whenever possible, to meet with people face-to-face and spend those important moments with them. There seems to be something instinctive and, and maybe even universal about the realization that life and love are expressed and demonstrated when we're together with our families. So the question I want to ask today is, is, do we really need the church? Or maybe why do we need the church? In what ways does this passage illuminate what it's like to live life as a church together? Our focus over the past year at this church, at Coast Vineyard, has been a lot on getting out of the four walls of this church, going into our neighborhoods, going into our workplaces, going into our cities, and meeting people who are outside the walls of the church to take the miraculous reality of the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God, into the world. And we have seen here so many people be touched by the presence of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we've seen people healed here in this church and out in the streets and neighborhoods. Many of us have felt our hearts stirred uh, by Jesus' exhortation at the end of the Gospel of Matthew to go, therefore, and make disciples of all creations. And as we're moved to go out from here, how do we then continue to think about this place? This church home, this community where we meet and where we come and where we worship, especially for those of you who consider this to be your church home. And so if you're following along in your bulletin, you got a pen or you're taking notes, the first question is, do we really need the church? If we're called, if Jesus sanctifies us and saves us and allows us to have direct access and we no longer need a high priest, we've established that, and then he sends us out What is the purpose of the church? I mean, you've probably heard a hundred times from a hundred people, you know, I don't really need to go to church. I experience God some other place. I experience God when I'm surfing. I experience God when I'm hiking. I experience God when I'm sitting with my my family or, or having a quiet cup of coffee in a mountain, you know, beautiful mountain vista. God is everywhere, right? So what is the purpose of coming to church? Those are all right things. God is everywhere. Or maybe you've heard people say things like, you know, I I consider myself spiritual, but I'm not really religious. And that can actually, that can mean a lot of different things. But one of the things that mean is, is I have a personal kind of faith, but I'm not involved in any kind of corporate religion anywhere. I don't, I don't consider myself a member of any kind of religious body. 
If Jesus has saved us and sent us, why can't we just be going out? What is the purpose of church? And I want to suggest, and I think that the passage in Hebrews reminds us, that integral to Jesus' saving process is our sharing together as a church in the life of Christ. Just as Christ reconciles us to God and He makes us holy in the same way, we're called to share a communal life together in all times and in all places. This is why Hebrews goes straight from this theology conversation to a communal life discussion. And so all through the Bible, we get these images of what the church is like, especially toward the end of the New Testament. Uh, images like the church is the body of Christ. Sometimes it's called the bride of Christ. Some, you know, we're called all throughout Scripture the children of God. And there's even images of, of, of plants like the, you know, God is the vine and we're the branches and we're all connected in together. All of those images are meant to describe this intimate connection between us as individuals and then the relationship with other believers and with God. In that way, committing to a fellowship with a group of believers is kind of like visiting our families, right? No matter how far we go, we need a place to come back to. We need a place that we call home where we come and, 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 and celebrate with people and experience those milestones in our life together. Our desire to go out is hopefully matched by our desire to return home. Whoever sends us out, whether it's our parents or our, our families, however we're sent out, we always want to be thinking about what it means to come back. So what does this mean? Well, first and most importantly, I want to emphasize the church is not a building. The church is not this building. The church is not, the church is not 90 minutes on a Sunday morning, or if you know, some churches it's three hours, and maybe some churches it's 45 minutes, depending on where you grew up. Um, we are the church, and I want to make sure you hear and understand me. So when I say committing to a communal life as the church, don't think I'm talking about this building, this place, this time, but we are the church. We take the church with us wherever we go. So as we go out, we are taking the church into the world. There's this great line where Jesus says to Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against that. And I always had this... Uh, I don't know what I thought that meant as a kid, but I always had this image of like gates prevailing against the church as if like, you know, the gates were on the offensive somehow. But it's the other way around, of course. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because the church is advancing. The church is going out. The gates of hell are on the defensive in that image. Uh, so uh, we take the church with us wherever we go, but we're not intended to do it alone. That's the thing. Hebrew says, don't neglect meeting together. When I'm thinking through the implications of a passage and I'm wrestling through what it means theologically, I always ask myself, could this survive what, what I call the desert island test? This is my own desert island. Okay? Because some people make theology so complicated that if you found yourself on a desert island, somehow you couldn't be a faithful follower of God. And I never want to make theology that complicated. I always think that God is simple and God is everywhere and God will save me. And if I ever found myself on a deserted island, I could live a faithful life devoted to God and would be in his presence when I died. And so if I remember that I am the church wherever I go as I have Christ in me, then I can be confident that if I ever found myself on a deserted island, uh, the church would be there with me. It would just be a smaller church and it'd probably be a sad little church because it'd just be me. There's this old story about this guy. You may have heard this before. This is an old one. This guy's rescued on a deserted island, and as he's standing on the deck of the rescuing vessel, the captain says to him, I thought you were stranded alone on this island, but I see three, three facilities, three little huts on this island. And the guy says, oh, yeah, well, that hut on the left, that's, that's where I lived, and that hut in the middle, that's where I go to church. And the, the captain is like, well, what's the third building? And the guy looks at him, and he's like, well, that's where I used to go to church. All right, bad joke. <laughs> of course, the church is <clears throat> universal. It is throughout the world, and it is local. It's visible. The church is visible in the buildings and in the gatherings of the people of God. And the church is invisible because it's in our hearts. The church connects us to traditions around the world. 
We meet today on Sunday morning, and we know that there are people meeting all over the world. There are rich people and poor people. There are people of every single ethnic group on every continent of the world over the past 2,000 years gathering to do what we do, to worship the Savior and give Him honor and glory. What a connection that that offers us here as the church. I actually really like the vineyard uh, in our statement of faith. If you've ever read it, there's kind of what the little bulletin looks like. You can actually get it free online. It has a really beautiful statement about what it means to be the church. And so I pulled it up. Um, I'll just read it to you. It says, We believe in one holy universal church. All who repent of their sins and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior are regenerated by the Holy Spirit and form the living body of Christ, of which he is the head and of which we are all members. So this doesn't mean that the only way to attend church is here. I said that. It doesn't even mean that to be a member of a church is, you means you have to be part of this denomination. I think the vineyard has important things to say about the truth of the gospel, but there are lots of other ways to worship and, and understand God. In fact, God tells us this very specifically in his scriptures in 1 Corinthians. This is a passage you may be familiar with if you've come to church before. He says, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And of course, we are the body of Christ. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. And so... We see the diversity of the kingdom of God. We know that there's supposed to be a diversity. You wouldn't expect uh, a church in, in Norway to look the same as a church in Kenya. It doesn't mean that they're not faithfully following God. It just means that the culture that, 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 that those folks find them in, the gospel is transforming that culture in a unique way, and the people have unique needs. And so we recognize that there's diversity in the kingdom of God. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about. If the, if the church is a bit like a body, a couple of ways to think about that. The first one is, I, my hope is, if you think about the church like a family, that families accept each other. You know, they say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, families accept each other because they really don't have much of a choice. <laughs> You're still my, you know, whatever, no matter what. And that means that you got to accept the weirdos, all right? I don't know about your family, but my family has a couple of weirdos. I think I am the weirdo, if you ask some of my family members. But, uh, you know, you've got to accept them because they're your family. You might disagree with every single thing that they say politically. You might cringe every time they post something on Facebook because you just know you're going to disagree with it. But still, they're your, they're your relative, and so you love them, and when the time comes to sit down over a shared meal together, you come together and you say, hey, you're my uncle, you're my cousin, you're my whatever. God bless you. Let's, have, let's share a meal together. Um, we don't always have to agree, and we're not going to agree, but we're still family. You know, the church is really called all throughout Scripture to unity. This is a great passage in John chapter 17. Uh, I want to put this up. It's small. But Jesus is praying for his disciples, and he's praying this beautiful, called the high priestly prayer, and he specifically says at one point, I don't ask for these only, meaning for the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, meaning all of us, the church. We believe because the disciples went out and proclaimed the word of God, that they may be one, just as you, the Father, are in me. And he goes on. So God wants there to be unity in the church. And uh, I had this thought the other day that, you know, bringing a friend to church if they've never come to church before, it's kind of like uh, bringing a friend to your Christmas dinner or like bringing a significant other and introducing them to your parents. You know, it's, it's scary. You, you want them to have a good time. You're like, please don't let it be awkward. You just want people to come and relax and enjoy just like when you bring somebody to your family dinner. And we want Coast to be a welcoming place. We, we strive to make this a place where people can feel welcome. If you feel awkward, I'm sorry. Uh, personally, I'm sorry, because I want you to feel welcome, and I know this church tries hard to make this a welcoming place. The second thing is that um, families, we talked about this already, but families come together. Hebrew says, don't neglect meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. To be a family, you've got to talk, you've got to meet together, you've got to catch up and connect with each other, share with each other's lives, and maybe it's not as often as you would like, you know, some families, you may only get together for weddings or funerals or, 
or maybe, you know, the occasional Christmas. But if you're family, you come back together at some point when you're able. And I think in the same way that churches are like families, we find ourselves traveling some weeks. We find ourselves in places where we're not able to be here all the time. But wherever your church home is, get together with those people. Celebrate with them. Share in the communal life together. Remember, most of the New Testament books were written explicitly or implicitly to churches, to churches, groups of Christians meeting together in cities all around the ancient Near East. When, we think, when I talk about 1 Corinthians, it was up there, that's the church in Corinth, a city in, in, in the Near East. Paul was writing to that church. Same thing with the Ephesians in Ephesus or the Galatians in Galatia or Philippians in Philippi or the Colossians in Colossia or the Thessalonians in Thessalonica. The Bible was written to churches. And so we, I think as Christians who've been influenced by, you know, kind of Western thought and, and a lot of uh, sort of enlightenment thought that's come down to us, we, we sit down and we read the Bible and every time we read the word you, we have a tendency to take it as kind of singular you, you know, um, that it's, it's for us. And, and there is a real truth that when we sit down and we have our devotions that God's call to his church is his call to us individually. So don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there isn't a singular you in there. But most of the time when you get into the Greek, it's a, it's a y'all. You know, we're not from the South, but it's a y'all. It's, it's like an all y'all, you know. So if we, could, if we could practice reading that you, not just in the singular, but also in the plural, you, the church, do these things that I'm exhorting you to do, I think it would better help us understand the collective nature of God's call to us as the church. You know, even as families, uh, even families, I think, have to work hard to live together in peace and harmony. I just want to say a little bit about, uh, just like there can be some toxic family dynamics, there can be some toxic church dynamics. And if you've been around the church for long enough, you know that there are toxic church dynamics from time to time, unfortunately, because the church is filled with people, you know, uh, and so we're not perfect. In fact, if you find a perfect church, you probably should run. Um, but churches, just like families, require boundaries. Churches, uh, appropriate, healthy boundaries. Churches, just like families, require truth-telling. Um, churches require... Uh, being gracious and loving to people as they seek to grow and make mistakes. And so I hope that we've got space for that, but also understand that there are some times where it's not always possible that where your church home is is healthy at that particular moment, just like there may have been times in your life where your particular family wasn't healthy at that particular moment, and you have to figure out how to navigate that. The hope is always, wherever that dysfunction lies, that God is working it out and fixing it, and that you can be part, as children of God, we can be part of healing it so that there can be restoration and wholeness brought back into that situation. And the last thing is, is uh, I put up here, being family means getting involved. May not be true in every household, but the difference between a guest and a family member in most households is the guests get just to sit and relax. The family member's got to pitch in. If you're family, you've got to help do the dishes. If you're family, you've got to help make the mashed potatoes. Uh, if you're family, you've got to do whatever, help, you know, throw away the garbage or whatever it is. That's what the family members do. The guests get to come and relax and enjoy because they are guests in that particular moment. And I think that's true here too. You know, if you're here uh, for the first time or the second time or this isn't your church home, you are our guest. Don't feel like you have to do anything here because you're here as our guest. And it's great for families to have guests and for churches to have guests as well. But for those of you for whom this is your church home, where our hope is that you're going to get involved. Because if you're just sitting here and you're not getting involved, well, that's like the family member who, who doesn't get involved, right? Then everybody's going to say, why aren't you getting involved? <laughs> this is a great pastor in Dallas um, named Tony Evans. He's a pastor of this Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, big African-American church in Dallas, and he's a great preacher. I listen to him all the time. He has this expression for people who sit in churches and never get involved, uh, he says that they are pimps in the pews. He says that the pimp is the person who wants to benefit but doesn't want to do any of the work. He's like, I don't want there to be any pimps in the pews. That wasn't my expression. So if you have a problem, you can tell Pastor Jamie, but I did not make that up. But I think it's a great image because we don't want there to be people who are just sitting around month after month and year after year and not getting involved because that's not what it means to be family. So how do we get involved? Well, couple practical things. Um, 
for me personally, one of the things I'm going to try to do this year is I'm going to try to show up on time. Uh, because it's, I'm so terrible at that, especially if I'm not doing something that week. But it's, it's, it's so funny because if there's somebody sitting in here at 10 o'clock, you know they're either on the worship team or they're a guest. <laughs> there's only people that are in here at 10 o'clock, for the most part. I mean, I, no offense to the other people who occasionally are here. Um, but that's how you get to know people. You come early and you stay late. This Christmas, I had the real privilege of meeting a cousin who I have not met since she was one year old. First time I've, I've, I've had a chance to hang out with her since she was one year old, and she's an adult now. How cool is it to come early and stay late and get to know the people who are here? Or maybe it means join a small group. You know, if you're looking for a low-risk way to get connected, maybe consider doing the tabernacle team, helping set up and tear down, helping uh, Patrick back there in the back get, create this beautiful space that we get to worship in. Or maybe it means giving, you know, starting to actually give of your time and your, and your talents and your treasure. Jesus says in Matthew, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And everything we do here takes some resources. Maybe that's the way of, of getting involved. So I want to bring it back to Hebrews here. Um, when we recognize that our commitment is to the church, like it's a commitment to our family, it illuminates the significance of the passage we read today. Because... We're welcomed into God's presence as individuals, but in profound ways, we worship together as the church. God sanctifies us as unique sons and daughters, but he constantly cleansing his church as well, preparing his bride for that final wedding day when he returns. And that's how I want to bring it back to this idea of Christmas, that we are still in the Christmas season. Because we live in a world, uh, we talk in the vineyard about the kingdom of God being now and not yet meaning that the kingdom of God comes in the person of Jesus, but it's going to come in its ultimate fulfillment when he comes again. And we find ourselves, just like the Old Testament, waiting for Christ's return, waiting for the time when he's going to come back and remake his perfect creation as it was always meant to be. Like the Old Testament people of Israel, we're waiting in hope for the Messiah, for his second coming, for his triumphant return. So let us work, let us worship, let us wait together as the faithful people of God for the glorious incarnation future. Not for the incarnation past, but for that incarnation future when he will come again in power. And I just, I pray that Lord Jesus will come soon. If I can invite the worship team to come on up. And uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and invite the prayer team up at the same time as well. And I've heard from a lot of people on Facebook and other forms of social media that 2006 has not been everyone's favorite year for lots of really complicated reasons. Uh, it seems like every half an hour, some, some new person has passed away. Have you guys noticed that in the last couple of weeks? And um, I'm not a big New Year's resolution person. I think a lot of people see them as sort of silly, and I sort of get that. But, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is that there's nothing special about this particular day in the sense that it's January 1st. The sun came up today. It uh, came up yesterday. If, unless the Lord returns, it'll come up tomorrow. But all throughout Scripture, God is a God that recognizes the seasons and the times. And if you read the Old Testament, you realize that he's constantly saying, on this day, do this thing. Remember what I've done for you before. Tell other people about it, and then expect me to do something new. And maybe that's kind of the Old Testament equivalent of a New Year's resolution. Right? It's, it's looking back, remembering, and then planning on what God's going to do in the future. Last year, when I preached, I preached the same January 3rd sermon last year. I, I invited us to, for 2016 to be a year of reading Scripture, getting deep into Scripture. And it also became a year of going out. But I, I hope that 2017 can be a year in continued investment in our family here in the church. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to do uh, ministry a little bit different than we sometimes do it. I'm just going to give us a, a moment of quiet, and I want you to, to think about what God is putting on your heart for the next year. You know, one of the things about Vineyard Churches is that we always create space for, for God to respond. You know, in some churches, the most important part of the service is, is the, the communion, you know, when, when the priest raises up the thing and that's the center of the service. In other services, the center of the service is the sermon. You know, in vineyard churches all over the world, the center of the service is the response of people of God to his message. So if you walk out and you haven't responded, whether it's in your seat or up here for prayer, 
you've missed an opportunity to feel the center of the service. So I'm going to let Jason play quietly. I'm going to give you a chance to come and, um, and seek what God's asking in your heart. And if you feel God has put anything on your heart, anything on your heart, come on up and get prayer in the quiet, in the silence. We're going to do this a little bit earlier than we normally do. So let's bow our heads. And if you feel God's put something on your heart, go ahead and come on up at any point. out on the opportunity to share that prayer with others. We had a word this morning just that God's mercies are new every morning, that there may be people here that are looking for that opportunity for a fresh start. This is the perfect time. There is no time like today. Come on up and get prayer if you need that fresh start. If God is reminding you that his mercies are new every morning, that he is faithful. Come on up and give prayer for that too. And if, if you've come here today and you've never, you've never committed your life to God and you don't know, you feel like a guest, not just in this room, but you feel like a guest in the family of God, Jesus welcomes you. And anybody up here, including myself, would be happy to pray with you. Don't miss this opportunity to take that first step toward that new family and into the kingdom going to let the music play in the background for one more minute. transition into another song of worship, keep coming. If God puts something on your heart, keep coming. Just because we start to sing together corporately does not mean that uh, these people here are not able to pray for you through that singing. Let this final song of worship be the time when you make the commitment to whatever is next in your life, whatever is that next step. And if God's put it on your heart, you're welcome to stay in your seat, but don't hesitate to come on up because there's something about sharing that with somebody else that helps cement it and make it real in our lives. Uh, well, let's go ahead and stand together and sing one more song of worship together as we continue in the time of ministry up here on the stage. If you're receiving prayer, please, please continue to receive prayer. If you want prayer for anything, physical healing, emotional stress, anything that God may put on your mind, the, uh, the prayer team will be up here to continue to pray. But you know, we are a family. This little, this little branch is just one part of that family. And my family, when we say the grace before a meal, we hold hands together. In this church, when we prepare to leave the place, we join hands as symbolically recognizing that we are all one family. So if you guys would join hands with one another, stretch across the aisles, find somebody that you can hold hands with, I can almost guarantee they've washed their hands. They're probably clean. <laughs> let's, uh, as we prepare to go out from this day, let's remember that we are the family of God, that this is our family, words and all. Let's commit to loving and serving one another in the next few days, weeks, months. Our, uh, my closing words come straight from the passage we read today. At the very end of the book, the author writes, Now may the God of peace who brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, church, to love God and to serve one another.